Hello? Hi, my name is Jeremy. This is Red Means Recording. It's Sunday. I have a tequila hangover, and uh, I'm going to do a video on mastering. I asked patrons for tracks to master, and uh, I'm going to show you how I do the thing. We're going to be using some different tools. We're going to be using this, louder than liftoff, silver bullet. It's pretty cool. We're going to be using Ableton. We're going to be using Isotope Ozone. I guess let's just get into it, okay? Great job. Hi again. I'm, I'm really blurry, but that's okay, because we're paying attention to this. This this friend right here. Friend. This is the uh, Louder Than Liftoff Silver Bullet. It is uh, my first step in mastering. It's a stereo analog color unit with a band axle EQ. It has two modes for the transformers. It has a, a mode that emulates an API transformer, and it has a mode that, um, that does a Neve transformer. These are two... Uh, classic mixing desks that uh, the, each channel on the mixing desk sort of imparted a, a special tone and color to the whole thing. And it's a kind of a cool, cool thing. So why do I have this? Well, cause it's just kind of like magic. People talk about non-linearity and the importance of analog gear. And a lot of it I think is bullshit, but this friend right here um, has been one of the coolest purchases I've made in terms of just sort of having like a go-to thing that does magic. So anyways, we have uh, um, the ability to run tracks from Ableton into here, and that's the first thing I'm gonna do for this mastering process. Actually, the first thing I'm gonna do is adjust my stool. There we go. So I've got a session in Ableton right here. I have all the tracks that were sent to me via Patreon. We're going to start with this top one, I guess, uh, since I already dropped the thing on. So um, I like to use in Ableton this uh, external audio effect. Basically, it allows me to send audio out to a particular output. I have my Focusrite interface here sending out three and four to this friend, and then this is sending back three and four in here. And I have a utility for some gain compensation because when you're making adjustments in mastering, you really want to be able to A, B it, and uh, meaning like check the original and then go back and check the colored signal at the same volume so that you just hear what you've changed as opposed to, um, you know, any like jump in volume. So let's uh, let's check out this track real quick. We got like a techno affair, it's pretty cool. Okay, so I already messed with this a little bit and um, I'm gonna turn this on and then we'll listen to what it sounds like differently. Hopefully the YouTube compression doesn't destroy this. So I don't know if you can hear, but we're getting a little bit sparkle up in the top end. Um, the whole mix kind of comes forward a little bit. One of the things I noticed that this does um, is imparts a bit of extra stereo image, which we're actually going to um, sort of tackle uh, later on. But what am I doing here? Well, I'm running it through the API transformer. This is um, saturation. This is like how much you're driving the transformer, and this is how much the output is. This thing is great, but it does um, it does end up sort of distorting in interesting ways on certain kinds of material. So you really have to listen for distortion. You also have the ability over here to um, run them into each other. So I can run the Neve into the API and the API into the Neve, which is pretty dope. Over here is the EQ section. I always turn on uh, tight and vintage. What this does is clears up a little bit of the uh, super lows, like down at the end, it's like a little shelf EQ. And the same thing for up here. So we're rolling off the uh, extreme top and highs, which, um, generally don't have a ton of information anyways. And then in conjunction with that, we have a two band EQ, highs and lows. And you can select whether or not you're boosting or cutting the air, which is super highs, or the presence, which is gonna be around 3K or so. Um, and same thing, bass or sub, you can choose whether or not you wanna boost or cut the bass or sub. So in this case, I am adding some air and I am leaving the bass sort of right where it is without a uh, with the exception of uh, passing through the tight thing. So once again, let's take a listen to that. I'm doing this in headphones. Um, I really, really should be running it through my speakers. I have a pair of Aventones, which are tiny little shitty speakers over here. And I have a pair of Dynaudio BM6As Mark IIs, which are sort of my nicer speakers. Um, I like to check them on both before I commit it to audio, uh, before I print it. Um, so bear with me, I'll be right back. 
So the uh, the BM6As have a very pronounced sort of top end that um, like up in the sparkle area. I can definitely hear that coming through when I listen to these on the speakers, which is awesome. Um, I'm not I'm not hearing it sound brittle or anything like that. So that's pretty much what uh, what I'm looking for. I'm gonna try um, messing with the bass just a tiny bit. Cool, so uh, a little bit of extra bass sounds sounds good. I have decided that I like these settings. Unlike a plugin, I actually have to uh, commit this now. So I'm gonna give myself a little bit of space, a little bit of en entry space there. And uh, yeah, and then I'm going to export this. Now, because this is a uh, an external effect, it's going to do it in real time as opposed to the way that we're used to. So let's check out these settings real quick. My native Ableton is set up for uh, 48K32, and that's what I want here. No dither. It's not even on there. We'll dither later. Do, 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 do. Now you can see that we are waiting for the external instruments and effects to become silent. And now it's just going to play this out in real time into this. So I'm going to go ahead and pause and um, we'll tackle one more in this and then I'm going to move on to Ozone. I want to do this one next because this one has vocals. So that should be zeroed out. You can see we're hitting the transformer pretty hard. So I'm going to go ahead and turn down the gain here which sends to it. All right, let's give ourselves. So this has lots of air. I don't need a air, but I am thinking about adding just a little bit of presence. And you can turn off the whole EQ thing by turning on tone. So that's before, and that's after. I think that brings out the vocals really nicely. So uh, just finished exporting that. Why do I keep looking at this fucking monitor? I'm, I'm obsessed with my own face. My face is the front of shop. I am going to silver bullet the rest of these tracks, but I'm not going to do it on camera because um, it's boring. There are there are software alternatives to uh, this thing. I don't know if any of them are actually going to sound quite the same because this does impose a sort of um, non-linearity to the stereo field and stuff like that that I really, really enjoy and have not been able to emulate in software. Do you need this? No, absolutely not. I pass a lot of tracks directly into Ozone and don't touch this sometimes. I've run tracks through this or tried to run tracks through this and had them not uh, sound better. It is a silver bullet, but it's not. And uh, I just wanted to show you because it is the first step I like to try to use when I'm mastering. The next step will be taking things into Isotope Ozone, which is a mastering suite. And I'll show you how that shit works in a second. But first, I'm going to silver bullet the rest of these. So see you in a little bit. God, this is right in front of my fucking face. So we did all the silver bullet stuff. Now we're gonna bring this into isotope ozone. But first I wanna show you something. So I was an idiot and when I was doing my silver bullet mixes, I accidentally um, didn't check the output of the uh, the track when I was exporting. And um, I got a little, a little clippage. A little clippage there. But this is the advantage of working in 32 bit. I can just see it. See that information is still there. We're all good. So I'm going through these real quick and just checking for headroom, making sure that the headroom or the amount of uh, space between the peaks and zero dB are all happy. Welcome to Isotope Ozone. This is my mastering software. I'm going to make a new project and I don't need to save that. We're going to select 48K. It will resample your tracks coming in if you uh, choose a sampling rate that is not the same as the one that the tracks are coming in. Um, unfortunately, that's not a great way to work. Um, you want to do your downsampling to 44.1, which is sort of like the distribution standard uh, after you've done everything. So um, make sure that you set your sampling rate to the same rate as your pre-masters here. Now we're going to drag all the tracks in. Yeah you have the ability to do one, two, three, four, five, six, I think six different modules here, and you have a selection of modules. Let's just go ahead and add a whole bunch just so we can see. You can also include external VSTs in here if you want to. 
Um, I don't ever do that. Like I can put all my plugins in here if I want. So that's cool, you know, but uh, I don't need to do that. I'm just gonna use what's in Ozone. These can be rearranged, which is real nice. And yeah, I have a sort of like a setup that I do in Ozone um, and we're going to sort of follow that. First thing I wanna do is go over to my IO and change this to LUFS, uh, which in this case is called integrated. LUFS uh, actually measures the loudness of the track as opposed to like the decibel level or the uh, RMS. And it's the most accurate sort of way for me to check out that kind of shit. First off, let's talk about loudness because I did a video on LUFS and I was like, y'all should just master to negative 14 LUFS because that's what the Spotify, or negative 13 LUFS because that's what the Spotify standard is and they'll turn your shit down otherwise. And then Skrillex comes and puts out a video where he's got Isotope Insight, which is a uh, metering program in his Ableton session. He's playing his track and he's got it at negative six. Um, so, you know, I'm not gonna say I was completely wrong, <laughs> but um, I do think that different genres get mess, uh, mastered to different loudness standards. And um, we're actually gonna aim for hotter uh, this time around. We're gonna use the CD standard as opposed to the, um, the streaming standard. Uh, the first thing we wanna do for these tracks is go up to our mastering assistant. And the reason I'm doing this is because this is going to set my LUFS level for me. So I'm gonna find like, the part of the track that's the loudest, that has the most stuff going on, so this sounds good right here. And uh, I'm gonna let uh, Ozone just kind of do a thing, and it's gonna set a bass level thing for us to start with. Cool. All right, so uh, our maximizer, which I'm always gonna keep at the end, personally, that's how I do. Uh, has been set to negative 4.6. We have a ceiling of negative 0.3. That's fine. You can see our kicking in here. Our LUFS level is about negative nine or so. Uh, that's fine, that's, that's all good. I do like to go into my equalizer and like the thing that I did with the uh, silver bullet, I'm gonna take these down. This is sort of just a general thing that I do. Around 30, something like that. And then up at the top end, I'm gonna do the same. We're gonna add a tape. And I do this to everything. I really like the way this particular tape part sounds. I've never not liked it, this clean character bit. So there we go. Uh, the, the tape thing here is going to basically uh, introduce uh, Ozone's version of some non-linear tape saturation. It just does a tiny, tiny thing that I always like. I, it's one of those ineffable things. And the thing about mastering is that you really don't wanna have to make gigantic changes here. Um, mastering should not be like a sledgehammer. It should be a series of really small movements that just sort of bring everything together. Over here, we have a dynamic EQ, which is bouncing up and down some frequencies. This is different than a multiband compressor, which oh, you'd find over here. Um, which I may or may not use, I'm not sure. Um, the one thing I always do to the stuff that goes through the uh, silver bullet is I add an imager. This is a multiband imager. We're gonna hit learn and uh, we're gonna let it pick out the frequency bands. Um, so let's do that real quick. Okay, so uh, down here is our polar sample phase um, meter. Uh, it shows us how much phase difference, uh, how much stereo separation we're getting between each band here. So, you know, I could go through each band individually and make adjustments if I needed to. What I like to do because um, the silver bullet, God bless its heart, uh, introduces a bit of stereo uh, separation, non-linearity, either through it's processing itself or just because um, inherently the outputs of an analog device are not, I mean, they should be balanced. They should be the same, but sometimes there's a little bit of difference. So I'm gonna go take those bases down to negative 100. Um, I would never do this for stuff that's like straight up acoustic or, um, or orchestral, but for electronic music, I want that bass to just like hit right in the middle.
you know, that's it. <laughs> that's all this track um, needs. Uh, it doesn't need the dynamics. Remember how we talked earlier about gain matching? You can AB between your wet and dry signal to only hear the change and not the volume change, uh, the processor change. So uh, Ozone has a little thing here called gain match, um, which when I bypass this, it's going to gain compensate the uh, input to match the gain of the output so that I only hear what the process is doing to this. So let's go ahead and check that out real quick. Cool. So what I'm hearing is we have sort of introduced a little bit of sparkle. We've um, probably, you know, we're catching some peaks to bring it up to the left level that we want. I think that sounds good. Let's move on to, what's that one I really liked? Uh, is it this one? So again, uh, we'll hit Mastering Assistant. We'll hit CD. It's a really, really chill track. Really different than what we had last time. This actually got run through both the Neve and the API uh, transformers in the louder than liftoff thing um, because it just sounded really good to pump it up through those color saturators. You know, it sounds good. All right, so gain match. Um, let's go ahead and add the tape that we had before and our imager and we'll hit learn. Whatever's down here, we're gonna bring it down. And you're listening to how it hits your ears, how the low end hits your ears, how the highs hit your ears, how the whole presence of the track sort of like comes in and fills your perception um, when you're listening to it. You're listening for things that distract you from the listening experience. So that could be something that is not there or that could be something that's too there. Wow, look at the phase on this. It is an incredibly stereo track. Look at all that movement. try something with this actually. Uh, where is my spectral shaper? We're gonna put that before here. This is sort of like a frequency dependent um, keyer, almost like a de -er for uh, very specific frequencies. It's a dynamics processor. I feel like this track has some stuff up here that's a little spitty. I'm not a huge fan of it. So, especially in that, um, in that crash. Let's go ahead and try it. Yeah, that that's nice. So that's just like bringing some of that really, really sort of like brittle top, top end down a little bit uh, in a sort of gentle way. I'm gonna listen to it on the speakers real quick. With this mix, it's it's really about like focusing it sort of like uh, it's a gigantic mix. I kind of want to focus its energy a little bit. Um, let's move on to this one. I can already tell I'm going to want to do something with that hi-hat. Actually, let's use dynamics for this. Whoa, what a curve. What a curve. There it is. You want to turn off auto because auto is going to um, bring the gain up for the amount of compression we're doing. We just want to compress that top end a little bit. And if I turn this off, you can hear that hi-hat jump back out again. So yeah, that's, that's nice. Uh, let's go ahead and add our tape. So this one's actually, we're gonna spread it out stereo-wise because compared to some of the other tracks, it's a little too focused in the middle and I wanted to have some ear tickle. So True Peak, let's go ahead and grab that imager first thing. 
because I want to sort of feel that. Um, so we'll hit learn. That phase meter, the vector scope, is showing that we really don't have a lot of stereo information going on. Um, so we'll check it band by band and increase it to something that... I don't, I'm not getting what I want out of that. So I'm gonna hit the stereoize button, which is actually going to introduce um, more stereo width uh, that I can play with. So let's go ahead and zero these back out again. All right, well, now, now we're gonna get more reaction. And that's fine up there. Uh, uh, sometimes I like to I like to keep that top end tight um, in terms of stereo field and let the mids and the the high mids and the low mids um, sort of define the stereo space. So be let's go ahead and A B that. Here's what it was before. And here's what we got with this imager. Just fills up the stereo space more. My philosophy with mixing and mastering is that I want you to feel like you're sort of like inside the track. I want it to envelop your ear holes. Um, and that's at odds with some other types of mastering and mixing techniques that I've heard. Um, but that's just how I like to work. So that's what I'm always aiming for. This is a really well mixed track overall. Uh, and the louder than liftoff silver bullet addition to it really helped um, bring the vocals out a little bit, but we're gonna make it even better now. Again, we have a very wide stereo image and that's okay. Like. I'm gonna do a tiny scoop down here. A little clean up scoop. Something like that. I'm gonna compress this band because there's a little too much information for my taste there. I'm gonna give this a little smile curve. See, this is nice because you can, the, the learn function, we, we pulled out, the vocals are just kicking it right here. Like this is where all the vocal information is. There's a lot of almost mud down here, um, but that's also, that's also the bulk of the song itself. So we don't want to fuck with it too much. Um, we can also see the snare is up here. So we're just giving it a tiny bit of compression. And then we're going to compress the top end just a tiny bit. This is just like sort of like the tickle of the idea of gel, like just the tiny bit of gel up at the top there. Uh, throughout, oh, actually, it's a tiny bit of gel throughout since we're compressing just like not even a dB. This is just a big expansive open mix. And I want to make sure that uh, it stays that way, you know? Yeah, I'm stoked on that. So uh, let's do an AB and listen to what happens to the mix. Um, we're gonna sort of lift it up a little bit, basically. Like it's just gonna be revealed a little bit more, and that's that's a, that's brilliant. Like I'm not exactly sure what part of this is doing that. Um, we have a bit of um, let me turn this off again. We have a bit of EQ boost, um, a very very small rise that uh, sort of boosts the low highs, <laughs> the one to two k range, where a lot of the information is. And then we're doing a little bit of compression. We're not doing any gain compensation for any of these bands. We got the vintage tape, which is always adding a little bit of zhuzh, and then we're doing subtractive uh, dynamics there. And then I actually brought the um, the mids where that information is. Remember, our vocals are up here, our instruments are down here. I brought this down a little bit in width just because it sounded like it was better focused to me that way. So uh, we'll bypass it and then I'll bring it in.
before I export everything, I want to adjust the tip and tail here of everything. Go over here and adjust the endpoint. Same thing with the end. You know, mastering is is as much about making things sound better as it is preparing them to actually go out to distribution. You know, you want to make sure that there's no weirdness at the ends. Okay. So. The exciting world of mastering. I hope what I've revealed to you here is that it's not really that complicated. This is mostly about listening and um, it really helps if you are mastering more than uh, one track together. Because then you start to be able to compare them to each other. There we go. Okay. Now, before we export, I want to turn on some dither. Dither is something that you will want to use if you are going from a higher bit rate and sample rate to a lower bit rate and sample rate, because it helps um, introduce sort of a smoothing algorithm that will uh, make your um, your audio not suck as bad because you're... God, that's a terrible fucking explanation. Darkroommastering.com says, Dither is low volume noise introduced into digital audio when converting from a higher bit resolution to a lower bit resolution. The process of reducing bit resolution causes quantization errors, also known as truncation distortion, which if not prevented, can sound very unpleasant. Um, dither is important. I just turn on all this shit and uh, leave it go. In Ableton, you can uh, dither as well. In Ableton, if you're exporting at the bit rate that your project is, then uh, the dither option will be grayed out. Um, it's only when you're going down. So then we're going to export the auto files. We're going to go to all tracks. We're going to add track numbers because I'm going to pretend this is a compilation. We are going to go to 41. Our dither is enabled. 41, 16 bit. That's the Red Book CD standard. If you know CDs still existed anymore, it's going to export, and that is it. Okay, so now that the tracks are mastered, we can do a before and after comparison. Keep in mind that most of what you're hearing is volume change, which masks the dynamic, frequency, and spatial changes made to the audio.
that's my mastering process. It's not that crazy, honestly. Um, I give some, I give things some analog flair, um, balance and saturation and tone with the silver bullet from Louder Than Liftoff. Then I go into Ozone and I let Ozone sort of set my luffs level based on uh, what I chose and um, add a series of plugins within Ozone, the imager, the tape, to shape the sound and add a little bit of sparkle. And then if I need to, I'll play with the dynamics and uh, the multiband dynamics and uh, maybe a spectral shaper or something like that to zero in on a particular like little issue here or there. Just try to make things sound good. You're listening for um, those parts of the mix that are distracting you from enjoying the mix. You want something to like hit more or hit less. And honestly, I mean, that's something you should be doing in your mix. Like mastering is not the stage that you want to fix mixes in. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. Uh, I'm happy to talk more about the techniques that maybe you use for mastering because there are a lot of different ways you can do it. This is just my way. And that's it. Thanks for watching. My name is Jeremy. This is Red Means Recording, and I hope you have a wonderful day.